Good friends, welcome for Sunday, September 27th. Welcome to these moments of worship and prayer and praise. Today is a special Sunday. Today is an important Sunday in the life of this church. On or around the last Sunday of every month, we're going to celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion in a digital way. We're going to trust that God enters into those elements of bread and wine, uh, cracker or juice, whatever we have available with, uh, with us. But we're going to trust that God enters into those in the mystery of the Sacrament of Holy Communion. Friends, I want to welcome you to worship this morning, and I want to invite you to press pause now and to find whatever elements you may have available for you so that we can get ready to receive the Sacrament of Holy Communion later on in our time of worship today. If you have some wine or some bread, if you have some grape juice or some cracker, whatever means you have available, I invite you to find those and to gather those with you for this time of worship this morning. My name is Nate Lidke, I'm the pastor here at New Life Lutheran Church, and I welcome you to these moments of worship and prayer and praise. It is such a privilege that through and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we gather together here. We gather together in this digital way, but we gather together with our neighbors who are near to us and neighbors who are very far away from us. We gather together this day to give God glory, to rest, to pause, and to reset our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Good friends, I'd invite you to begin this moment of worship with confession and forgiveness. The words will be on the screen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need. And through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth now that God proclaims, your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live now in freedom and in newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Would you pray with me? God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us. Guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Friends, may the peace of the Lord be with you all. Even as we gather together today, I would invite you to share signs of peace with your neighbors and with your friends. It's one of the traditions of this church and one of the oldest practices of the earliest Christian gatherings that we would come together, that we would greet one another, and that we would share signs of peace with one another. Being at peace with our neighbors and with our friends means that there's reconciliation, means that there's forgiveness, means that where there has been wrong, that now there is forgiveness and there is peace. I'd invite you to take just a few moments to maybe text a friend of yours or to reach out. If you want to post that on your social media right now, but I'd love for you to share signs of peace with your neighbors and friends this day as we practice this tradition and this faith practice of being at peace with one another.
on this Sunday. We're in week four of a sermon series thinking about spiritual beings, thinking about the divine council, thinking about angels and cherubim. That's our theme for today. Thinking about demons, thinking about the Satan. Finally, uh, ending our sermon series in a couple weeks, we'll think about the new humanity. Today, we're going to focus especially on angels and cherubim. We begin by exploring cherubim in the Old Testament. Our reading for today is from Genesis chapter 3, just uh, three verses. Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way of the tree of life. Cherubim, placed to guard the Garden of Eden, placed to guard the place that God resides. Second, I want to explore just very quickly a, a passage from the New Testament that speaks of angels. Luke chapter 1, beginning in Beginning in verse 8. Once when he, Zechariah the priest, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John.
Friends, for four weeks, we've been exploring spiritual beings. We've been thinking about the divine council. We've been thinking about angels and demons. We've been thinking about angels and cherubim. We're going to end our series in a couple weeks thinking about the Satan and then thinking about the new humanity. Today, angels and cherubim. We've been exploring this idea, this question, where does God reside? Where does God live? Where does God take up residence? And how do we get to God? Because in some ways, part of the biblical storyline has to do with the separation between God and God's people, and then the reconciliation or the reunion that we, that we long for. So we start thinking about this idea about where does God reside. God resides in the heavenly realm. But God does not reside alone. God does not work alone. Remember, that's what we, that's what we explored last week. God does not work alone, and neither do we. <laughs> so if God does not work alone, who does God work with? Well, God works with the divine council. We explored that last week. Who makes up the the divine council, who are part of the divine council, guiding and directing, um, uh, doing errands or doing God's bidding. Well, two members in particular of the divine council are angels and cherubim. Who are cherubim or cherubim? Cherubim, we often think of as chubby baby creatures with, with wings that kind of float around or, or fly around. We need, to, we need to get that image out of our head if we think about, if we think about cherubim. Cherubim are really, they're depicted as, as hybrid creatures, <laughs> okay? So when you think about cherubim, we think about kind of the union of two or three or maybe even four different animals all together. They're meant to be intimidating Cherubim, you know, I mean, think of this, uh, a goat with a lion's head and, um, and, and hooves and horns, um, but then with uh, like a, a serpent's body. I mean, weird, right? Different. They're meant to be intimidating. Cherubim stand as guards. Cherubim stand as guards in the... Uh, at the end of the Genesis account of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is, is God's heavenly dwelling, or, or the place where God sits. And the cherubim are set as guards to prevent us humans from, from in some sense, getting in and, and messing things up again. Now, cherubim are meant to be intimidating creatures, and so this much is true. If you see them, you are entering into the presence of God. That's meant to give us some pause. <laughs> Too often we think of God as this loving, caring, kind, and compassionate creature. And, and yes, God is, but God is also powerful, and God is also and this much is very true. God is awesome. To use a, an often used phrase, God is awesome. That we as humans stand in awe of God. It's the cherubim who stand uh, at guard at the, at the Garden of Eden. They stand guard protecting God's temple residence. It's the cherubim who are depicted throughout the Old Testament as um, standing or depicted in the, on the temple walls in Jerusalem and as the ones who hold the Ark of the Covenant. Two places which the Israelites, the Hebrew people, would say God dwells. And the cherubim stand as warnings. You are getting close to the presence of God. Cherubim. Now let's let's think about angels. You know those kind of superhuman creatures who who have you know feathery feather uh, uh, feathery wings. <laughs> Again, we need to get that image out of our head, out of our mind's eyes. Angels don't have wings. I know that that's difficult for us. 
Hallmark, the channel, and the cards have made angels into these kind of creatures that float or fly around with, with wings and, 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 um, and bring messages. And that much is true. If cherubim stand as guards, angels are, are messengers. Angels are humans. They don't have wings. But they're humans who, who, who come out of the heavenly realm and bring messages or direct God and God's people out in the world. If we think about God living in or residing in the, the heavenly realm, and the cherubim as the ones who guard and protect humans from getting in and messing things up, it's the angels who come out, who bring God's message out of the heavenly realm and bring that message out into your life and my life. Bring that out into the, out into the world. Angels are often, are often reminders of God's presence, not just locked up in this heavenly realm, but, but being brought out into, into the world. Now, when people encounter angels, and maybe you have encountered an angel in your life, but when people encounter angels, particularly in the scriptures, those people are often confused and often afraid. One of the first words that angels often say in scriptures is these three words, four words, do not be afraid. Three words, don't be afraid. Four words, do not be afraid. That's if to say, if you encounter an angel, a messenger from God, that's a big deal. God's ultimate purpose is to reunite heaven and earth. Cherubim stand as guards to protect the heavenly realm. And angels are those who, who bring messages out to God's people. Think about this idea that cherubim stand as guards and angels are those who push or those who send. Which brings me to this idea that often as parents, we serve both of those roles. As parents, we guard our children. We protect our children. We keep them away from really incredible or really dangerous places. But we also, as parents, we want to send them. We want to propel them. We want to empower them. We want to, we want to give them wings. <laughs> Children often, too, of their parents, they want to protect them in some way. And children want to give parents meaning and purpose. Angels and cherubim are guards and guides. So you and I look for and long for guards and guides. We look for guards so that we might stay out of the nasty places. But then too, that we might be guided to bring God's kingdom the heavenly realm on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Having given of ourselves and our time and our treasures, I invite you to pray this offering prayer with me this day. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us 
for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink. Send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. All this we pray through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. People of God, people of life, we gather as a holy communion for a meal that has been shared countless times in countless places and in countless ways. The first time that this meal was shared, Jesus was gathered around a table with a ragged collection of people, with, with outcasts, with betrayers, with the power hungry, the fragile, the lonely, and the lost. Friends, the first time this meal was celebrated, Jesus promised that it was for all time, that whenever the bread was broken and that the wine was poured, whenever and wherever the story was told around the table, that he would be there. And so today, we remember the story. As it's been told a thousand times over, we eat the bread and we drink the wine, and we affirm that we all belong to this table, and that Jesus is here. So now, if we come to this table angry, let the bread and wine be our peace. If we come to this table broken, let this bread and wine be our grace. If we come to the table betrayed, let this bread and wine be our wholeness. And if we come to the table in despair, let this bread and wine be our life. This is a holy table with food to fill the hunger world and wine to quench thirsty hearts. Thanks be to God. Friends, we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this. For the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you in whatever way is meaningful for you to come now to the banquet table where Christ gives himself as food and, and, and as drink. Whatever means you have available to you now, I would invite you to share with those around you. If you are by yourself, receive these elements, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. If you're with family members or with friends right now and you would like to commune one another, please go ahead and do so. As you raise the bread or as you give the cracker, whatever means you have available, just place it in your friend or your neighbor or your, your family's um, a hand and with these words, the body of Christ given for you. And then with juice or with wine, again, whatever means you have available, offering that to those around you with these words, the blood of Christ shed for you. Share in this holy communion now and receive Christ himself in the mystery of this holy sacrifice.
Now, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. We pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us now from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Allow me very quickly to share a couple of announcements as we connect and grow and serve and share in and through the ministries of this congregation. Our youth group has been and is now collecting uh, soda cans, pop cans, uh, any sort of recyclables uh, for redemption. And today, from 11 to 1, we're sorting and collecting those cans. If you can bring some cans, some bottles, whatever you might have available um, to the church between 11 and 1, we would sure appreciate that. Our men's group is meeting again tonight uh, from 7 to 8, or from 5.30 to 7. Our youth group is meeting tonight from 7 to 8.30. Our women's group meets each Monday at 6.30 for an online Bible study. This Tuesday from 2 to 6 p.m. is a, a blood drive hosted by LifeServe Blood Centers. Anna Lund is coordinating that. It'll be here in the sanctuary, actually, it, the room that we have available. Uh, you need to make an appointment in order to give blood, but one bonus of giving blood this time around in a safe and sanitized way is that uh, if you give a successful donation, what's known as a successful donation, um, uh, they will test that blood for antibodies. So you'll be able to know if you've had COVID-19 or not. I would invite you, if you would like to give back to the community, to schedule, a, um, a schedule an appointment to give blood this Tuesday from 2 p.m. until 6 p.m. Our uh, Wednesdays are full of food pantry and confirmation classes. Continue to hold both of those ministries in your prayer. Food pantry is averaging 50 to 60, sometimes even 70 families a week that come through the food pantry. Your gifts help sustain that ministry. Thank you for your continued support of the food pantry. By now, you, I hope, have heard that the council has approved a plan to regather beginning next Sunday, October 4th. By next Sunday, I'll be a whole year older. I have a birthday this week. But by next Sunday, we will gather together again. Now, I know that there are some of you who are very ready to regather. I know that there are also many of you who are very much not ready to, re to regather. Hear this word from me clearly. Welcome back. And if you're not ready, that's great. Know this. God loves you. We do too. If you're ready to regather, there's a list of protocols and practices that we're going to follow. Following those practices and protocols will allow others to feel comfortable to regather. You may not want to, from time to time, follow all of those practices and protocols. I would invite you to know that we've put those in place as a community so that we as a community can begin to regather. We're going to ask folks to RSVP. RSVPs um, are not required but so that we can have a sense of folks who are ready to regather at 8.15 and at 10.30 on Sunday mornings. We would love for you to call or to text or to email or to use the sign-up link available later this week so that we know how many people to plan for. Masks will be required. We will practice physical distancing. We won't be singing as a congregation. We won't be celebrating Holy Communion, and there won't be treats afterwards. The nursery will remain closed for a time. That said, 
we are making steps forward to regather, and I'm excited to be with you in person next Sunday. That means next Sunday and moving forward, we won't have a recorded worship service. We'll have a live stream worship service that will be available to you at, at a time that's convenient for you. But we'd invite you to uh, continue to use those online resources for those of you that are ready to do that. We'd invite you to gather with us next Sunday, uh, October 4th at 8.15 or at 10.30 as you are comfortable. Watch for more communication. We're going to put together a little video about what to expect, but watch for some more communication this week around those things. Receive these words of blessing. May the God of glory dwell in you richly. Name you beloved and shine brightly on your path. Now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Friends, go in peace. For Christ is your light. Thanks be to God.